usually markets should be maturing and trading in less crazy ways as they get older and yeah. mature and, and more money comes in. But Bitcoin isn't doing that. Bitcoin yeah. is staying crazy. And I think the pandemic has shown us that governments are completely terrible and it just keeps getting worse and worse every every month depending on where in the world you live right so if that's the case then um i might have to spin the question back onto you and ask you how much worse do you think governments and, and the financial industries will get and according to that i think bitcoin will get even stronger Is your crypto working for you? It can be with yield farming. But what are the risks? Hacking, volatility, poor smart contracts, scams. Even if you overcome the risks, there are still limitations. Do you have a million dollars to invest? Yield farming is a very complex, time-consuming, and expensive process. Can you imagine that not only you need to possess advanced skills to mitigate your risk and check smart contracts, but also you need to quit your job? In order to get the highest return, you need to manage thousands of platforms and check protocols around the clock. Well, not anymore. We are proud to announce the SwissBorg Smart Yield account. It's now possible for anyone to earn yield on most of your cryptos, such as USDC, Bitcoin, Ether, BNB, and only starting with 10 euros with the tap of your finger. So how does it work? It's simple. On a daily basis, Oracle scans and monitors all the different investment opportunities and delivers for you the best investment returns. So how is that more secure? Not only do we assess the best risk-reward ratio, but also your assets are protected by our MPC technology and our safety net program. And how it does deliver return? Well, because our system is scanning the market every single day, you get the optimal return on that day. How do you get started? It's easy in three different steps. The first one, you deposit. The second one, you start the yield program. And the third one, you start relaxing, enjoying your passive income. So guys, you know what to do. Subscribe to the Smart Yields, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. All right, guys, welcome back to part two with Sammy from Four Flies. We're gonna get a bit more technical, talking about trading, Bitcoin, crypto assets, and tons of cool stuff too. So stay until the very end. Sammy, it's a pleasure to see you again today, bro. Good to see you as well. Awesome, man. So first of all, thank you so much for all the inspiration last time. You know, you really shared some great knowledge and great stories. And now I have to ask you about trading specifically. And the simple first question that I think is very valuable to many people are the do's and don'ts. You know, a lot of people talk about you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, but don't emphasize the don'ts as well so much yeah. because it's all about building the right habits and eliminating bad habits. So if you don't mind sharing some of the, the great uh, lessons you've learned through your yeah. trading career. So I don't want to cover the basics that everyone always talks about because you can Google that in five seconds and yeah. see the same stuff. <laughs> but the first main don't that I want to cover is, um, is about taking unnecessary risks. And it's not for the same copy paste reasons that most people have read with research. Uh, a big reason to not take these unnecessary risks is that when you take these kind of risks and you lose money, you get hit in two ways. Number one, you get a financial loss, which is difficult to recover from. I always give the same example on my YouTube channel. If you lose minus 50%, you need to double your money to break even. So you are screwed. Like It's very, very hard. You need to work double as hard to, to make that money back. And that leads to number two, because you're screwed and you need to work double as hard, now your psychology has taken a hit. Mm. So the next time you want to get into a trade and you actually might see a really good opportunity, you know how badly you messed up the last time and now you know you have to recover that 50% loss, for example, and you just won't commit to a good idea. You might commit with less money than you should have or there could be any number of things that go wrong. And as I'm saying this, I know that many viewers are thinking, oh, wow, that's me just yesterday or whatever. Um, and that's where you pay a much bigger price than you originally think when you lose money. You know, people will set a stop loss. Okay, I'm fine to lose minus 30%, but are you fine to feel like shit the next day? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, potentially pass, because now it's opportunity costs. It's not just the money you lost yesterday, it's the opportunity you won't take tomorrow because you have no confidence in yourself. 
So you can avoid that by, uh, by, by not taking unnecessary risks, by trading with less money, having more um, confirmations with different indicators, doing the things that you probably know you should be doing if you've read a trading book, best practices, things that other successful traders do, you know, um, naturally, you know, that, that, that you know you should do. Follow those kind of principles and you tend to avoid those problems. That's a big one. That's a really good one. And that's so true. Like when people think, you know, I lost 50%, I just need to get 50% back. But it's yeah. no, like you said, it's 2x after that, right? Yeah, yeah. Just to recover, not even to make gains. Exactly. And, and actually to lead on from that, you know, a big part of it is, fortunately, it doesn't really apply right now. Most people have made money in this market. But um, when you have lost money, you're down by X percent. It's not... A case of oh wow okay i need to recover back to break even uh the, the correct way in my opinion to look at this is this is now my new starting point mm -hmm. and how do i go back up because there's just too much pain involved if you think about the struggle to break even um and that you know like as a as a trader you need to be able to have very strong thinking very uh, you need to be able to be very very neutral in your analysis and then suddenly switch to being extremely biased because you don't make money unless you're biased and you can't balance those psychological problems if you also feel like shit and and that's why uh you know one of the first steps and it's not easy but of course like what do you you know what do you expect it's trading right like you're trying to shortcut your way to millions or whatever i don't know what what the what the goals are for viewers but no one's trying to get you know you know coffee money we're, we're trying to get lambo money right and and yeah there's going to be challenges and i think this is a big one so that so if i could put it into a don't and a do would it be don't take unnecessary risk do have stop losses or what would the do be for that if, if you had to connect the two? First of all, I think a big part of it is understanding why there is the don't because yeah. that, you know, like it's, it's one thing to say, don't touch the hot stove. It's another to say because you'll get burnt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think that's important. As for the don't, yeah, not, not to take unnecessary risks. And I suppose the do that follows on from that is do carry out the risk management practices that you should know uh, that you should be doing. And if you don't know about them, then that's a sign that you need to research them and find out what they are. And it is simple things like use stop losses, uh, you know, make sure there's a lot of technical consequence, don't trade with too much money, or I should, I should say, uh, do trade with a healthy amount of money, which usually, by the way, this will shock a lot of people, is between 1% and 8% of the person's portfolio. If I've got $100 in my trading account, I personally will never trade with more than 8 to $15. And, and 15 is the absolute peak. It's, it's usually between 3 and three and $8, something like that. Uh, and that's a big part because, you know, the, the, I think the, the next kind of big do for me is, um, is is I do make sure that no trade can either make or break me. Uh... And, and, and there's never a situation where I'm entering a trade and there is any potential at all for me to feel either euphoric or despair. And by avoiding those, uh, I don't I don't get a high. Like, let's say I've made a lot of money. Now I feel really confident. Next time I'm going to take an unnecessary risk and lose at all. That doesn't happen because... You know, I might make plus 80% profit, but it would be on $100. Who cares? It's $80. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a big deal. Uh, if I did it on 100000 all of a sudden I'm thinking, okay, now, now we're talking about like half the cost for a Lambo. That's exciting, right? That's where the problems come in. And so this is another, you know, it goes back to risk management, trading with less money. You'll see that a lot of problems people have in trading, it comes down to, uh, to being overexcited or trading with too much. And so by removing the potential for despair or euphoria, you can um, you can really avoid the, the big issues in, in trading. That makes a lot of sense. It reminds me of one of Warren Buffett's quotes. I think it's something like, you know, you will see who's swimming naked once the wave goes down, you know, those who haven't managed their risk and stuff like that. And I don't know, <laughs> have, you, have you heard of that quote? I haven't, but uh, <laughs> it, it makes sense. It, I think it's, it's saying basically that uh, eventually what is what is there will surface. And, and either, yeah, you're you're exposed or overexposed or whatever. If you have swimming trunks or if you're naked actually right, right, in the water. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> and actually talking, before we talk about the waves, obviously by the end of the interview, I want to ask you about the current bull run, you know, how long it may last or may not last. That's a question that many people are worried about because of the trauma from 2018. But we'll cover that a little bit later, guys, I promise you. Uh, but still sticking to the do's and don'ts, any other like lifelong lessons that you learned through trading where you, you think, oh, uh, this was... Maybe even you learned it the painful way, right? It's something that hurts you and then you thought, you thought, okay, but this is a chance for me to improve, become a Sammy 2.0. What came to mind immediately when you asked me that was the fact that to be a good trader, you need to constantly focus on your own self-development and being honest with yourself. And I don't even need to go into the reasons for why that's good for the rest of your life, business, relationships, parents, whatever, you know, like it's, it's an amazing quality to have being honest with yourself. 
and uh, and trading forces that because if you can't face the fact that one day you took an unnecessary risk because you know you saw some other youtuber flexing his 80 percent profit and, and you thought oh my god i can't have this why can't i and then you took a stupid risk like you need to be able to look yourself in the mirror and understand that you were an idiot and you know not, not do it again there needs to be that element of okay you feel the pain so you don't do it again and then you take the lesson away from it too and um and trading forces you to do that so while i can't think of a specific situation like that I can absolutely guarantee that I go through that process like every month at least where, you know, I feel like shit because of a bad decision. And then I, I kind of sit with it. I make my, I make sure that, you know, I've written it down on my journal. That's another big do keep a trading journal. Um, th this is absolutely essential because we analyze the charts, but we don't analyze ourselves. And yeah. A trading journal allows you to do that. Every single major win streak I've ever been on ever has come from keeping a trading journal. Really? yeah like no it's 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 crazy it's like um it's as useful as a seat belt is in protecting you from a car crash you know like mm -hmm. it, that's how essential i see it you know it's such a small step it'll take you five ten minutes but the rewards are hopefully you double your wins you you have your losses kind of thing that's super cool so what exactly was it an, an example of what you put in your journal is it something that you've done you're not happy about is it a failure is it a success is it a tip for you the samuel of the future uh yeah all of them all of them so it would be you know here are the reasons i entered tr a trade the technical reasons there was a rising wedge rsi whatever volume i would write down these reasons i would write down the reasons i shouldn't have entered these are like uh, well yes we had a rising wedge but there wasn't enough volume stuff like that um and this will help me you know when i've got 10 20 entries this will make me see all right so these signs were quite useful mm. to follow these ones were quite unreliable and that's why i've come to a very strong conclusion that the rsi is useless for example mm. i strongly believe that uh, it depends on how you use it of course but it's it's pretty bad in my opinion like i came to that conclusion because i couldn't use it properly in my trading journal it, it led to failing trades another thing i would take into account is my physiological state am i well rested um drugs the previous day alcohol whatever uh, did I eat well? Have I been fasting for more than 24 hours? Stuff like that. These things can all impact your trades. Yeah. It could even be like, you know, uh, I only took a shower yesterday. I didn't shower today. You know, it really, and the reason I give very benign examples like that, oh, okay, today I'm wearing a green t-shirt. It's, it's because when I, when I coach people on how to fill in their trading journals, one of the things I'll really hit home on is no detail is small enough. You can remove details uh, afterwards, but you can't add them later because you'll forget. And so, uh, that's really, really important. And, and yeah, then there's also that brutal honesty, you know, um, I made a mistake by entering the trade, but why did I decide to rush into it? Is it because somebody was flexing a, a profit and I was, you know, I saw it on Twitter and then I felt bad because I can't make that money. Okay. Well, that's a sign that when I'm trading, I shouldn't be opening Twitter because it makes me feel a fear of missing out. You can, you know, you can't learn these things about yourself unless you document them. Yeah. And that's a big part of, of my success so far. That is so cool because it really feels like on top of Twitter where you can maybe go back and look at a few of your calls and stuff like that. But here is really deeper, right? It's the nitty gritty of yourself and understanding who you are. And yes, yes. And it's, it, it better be uncomfortable. That's how it works. And, uh, and, you know, you keep it to yourself. No one else needs to read it. Uh, but that, I think, is very, very important. It's a trading health check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But, you know, like you do this and it's kind of like a meditative process. Yeah, you ask yeah. yourself everything about trading and then you know, that works really well. So next time you're like, okay, well, what can I do about my personal relationships too? And you just kind of build that skill. Yeah. And that has been, you know, as a young guy for me, like, you know, someone has to either teach me those lessons or I need to get hit on the ground and learn them. But trading taught me them, which was very efficient. That's super cool. You just mentioned like just before, like an ascending triangle, then you talked about RSI. So, uh, you know, I try to always stress this, that technical analysis comes between chart patterns and technical indicators together. There's two main types. Um, could you tell us a little more about that? Like, uh, are, do, do you love seeing the graphs as a chartist? Do you love specific technical indicators? What are the things that you feel like, like at the, at this point, you just said RSI, I'm highly convinced that it's not that useful. Actually, other traders have told me the exact same thing in previous shows, but, um, yeah. Can you tell us a little more about that, that balance between chartist and technical indicators? Yeah. Uh, first of all, on the note of the RSI, the reason I don't like it is it's usually one of the first indicators that people learn. And it looks very easy to understand, but it is inherently misleading by saying things like when it's high, it's overbought. Yeah. No, it's the relative strength index. When it's high, it means it's relatively strong. And, oh. and so it's very misleading, you know, just, just by its names. Um, anyway, the, 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 the core kind of analysis that I like is, is more so chart patterns. 
I don't focus too much on the technical indicators because uh, one of the uh, one of the crude jokes I, I I use about this is you know people will slap on a, a bunch of indicators that are very very complicated to compensate for what they don't have, and you know this is like I got a big car I don't have anything downstairs kind of thing like that joke, uh, yeah. and um, and and so I mainly focus on chart patterns. It's a very good display of psychology. If the price goes up and then it trades sideways, uh, that that is a display of you know before there was a lot of momentum in the chart. Now people are a little bit scared. With time, someone like Elon Musk can come along and pump the price up. And now the chart has had enough time to consolidate. People have had enough time to digest the fact that now Bitcoin's current price is 45,000. And after three, four days of trading sideways, 55,000 doesn't sound so crazy anymore. Yeah. If we just suddenly shoot up there, it does sound crazy. People sell off. But when we consolidate, when we trade sideways, we form a bull flag, we form a rising wedge, mm -hmm. falling wedge, whatever, it doesn't matter. We form some sort of consolidation pattern. And now people are a little bit more comfortable with the idea of the price reaching higher levels. So when that pump does come, when that news does come, because it's all manipulated, yeah. obviously, when that, when whatever that stimulus comes, uh, whatever that stimulus is comes, now you've got, you know, people psychologically reset because we've consolidated to pump up higher. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why I think, you know, we, we went from 42 down to about 30K and that's what enabled us to go up to 48, not 48,000 now. Is that one of your favorite charts, like the, the bull flag, you know, as you said, you know, when you reach a new all time high and you consolidate for a while sideways, is that one of the exciting chart movements that you look at? Yeah, it's not specifically the bull flag or, or anything like that. It's just I'm looking for the market doing anything other than trending up. And that could mean it slowly trends down or it, it forms anything. It doesn't really matter. The point is the chart doesn't trade up. And as long as it doesn't dump quickly, it, in my books, it's a, it's a continuation pattern. Mm. And there are different ways you can, um, you can break down how reliable that continuation pattern might be. You know, a big one, in my opinion, is, uh, is you look at time frame analysis. You know, how long was the previous consolidation pattern? So, for example, we just, I don't know when this is going to be uploaded, but we just came out of a, you know, like 20 day mini bear market. And so as soon, you know, that's, that's pretty long term as yeah. a correction for this market right now. So when the volatility returns, these bull flags are usually a couple hours long, max. Mm. You know, we, we, we pump up, you don't even notice it if you, unless you look for it specifically. Yeah. And so being aware of those kind of things, you can start to say, all right, well, you know, we just came out of a very long term consolidation. So we'll probably pump quite a few times quite quickly now. And that way you can give more validity to a bull flag, for example. Are you seeking for those? Because a lot of people, as you know, a lot of these pumps are nonlinear in the sense that you know, there could be lots of boring stuff for a very, very long time. And now all of a sudden within the span, like you said, you said a few hours, sometimes, you know, like in 2019, I believe if you missed the 13 days where Bitcoin pumped the most, you would actually have negative, you would have losses if Based you missed that. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great indicator. Yeah, that's uh, partly what I'm talking about. Yeah, when, when, the, when the volatility returns, you might have X number of days of, uh, of, of upward volatility in our case, because we're in a bull market. And so the continuation patterns could be quite short during that time. So yeah, TD is very complicated, but it's good to know. It's good to know. And so in that case, in, in order to not miss those big bull runs, like what is the ratio you have for it? So you mentioned trading, I think it was up to 8% max of your portfolio of Bitcoin you trade in the rest. Well, what was the, the ratio again? I forget. So, um, you know, it depends on my confidence. If I've uh... just suffered a couple of losses, uh, January, I, I ended a massive win streak. It was amazing. It was like 80, 90%. I ended it with two losses and my confidence was absolutely shattered. So my next trade went down from, you know, maybe like a 10% allocation down to 1.5%. Oh, wow. For example, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. this is pretty extreme, but it's a very good way of limiting risk when you're trading badly. Cause yeah. a lot of the time, uh, you know, you might enter a lose a loss streak, but you want to, and so I would take more, um, steps like. Recently, I had a losing position, which could have become a minus 20% loss, but I closed half of it at break even because uh, I was thinking, well, I still want to be in this trade, but now I'm not so sure. So I'll just, you know, limit my risk a little bit more and close the position early. So there are a lot of different practices you can take. And one of them is, yeah, I choose to trade with less percentages of my portfolio, minimum 1%, maximum 8%, pushed up to 15 on occasion, uh, which is, in my opinion, stupid. So it's very rare. But uh, yeah, that's kind of. 
that's where I float at. That's so cool. With regards to trading, like, do you, are you trading also in the traditional world of finance at the moment, or is it mainly crypto? You met, you mentioned Tesla. Like, what is your ratio in terms of stocks versus crypto at the moment? Like, it's uh, unfortunately because I'm so young, I've never really had an account to trade these. I had one account. I won't mention with who. And uh, I did go long at 36. I was telling you about this. Yeah. It was 180 odd dollars before the stock split. Now it's 36. And my account got shut down because the trade went so well, I guess. Um, they will say it was for other reasons, but it's pretty obvious. It was just a very good entry with high leverage, so they didn't like it. Uh, and since then, I've never really traded other markets. Indices I love, obviously, but it's mainly crypto. Mainly crypto. That's super cool. Yeah, a lot of people, they, they, they see this as, you know, a high risk, you know, asset class. But, you know, I, there's lots of asymmetrical opportunities, right, in this yeah. space, which is... Well, they're, they're very well correlated. So, you know, one of the key things is dollar index analysis is a key part of my Bitcoin analysis. If the dollar is going down and you can analyze the entire U.S. economy, you can look at the political state. Do you think the dollar will get stronger? Yes or no. Over the next you know, one year, five years. And most people will say no. Yeah. So if you know, if you don't think the dollar is going to get stronger, then it has to get weaker. And by virtue of that, everything will rise in value. And if they rise in value in a market like Bitcoin, where everyone gets excited, a small rise will become a big fear of missing out rally. Mm. And you know, being aware of those things, I think, is important. That's amazing. So if I can sum up your technical analysis. So you were, you're talking about multiple time frames, depending on the trade. You're talking about finding support resistance, about charts. Uh, in, in terms of technical indicators, are there any other? Like, obviously, RSI is not so interesting, by the way. And, and that was the exact same reason. Uh, one of our, our guests said that, you know, when it's overbought, it's usually when it's trending. So uh, you don't want to kill a trend if you. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but are there any other tech? Are there some technical indicators that have worked successfully for you that yeah. Bollinger Bands or moving averages or any other? Bollinger Bands I also really don't like. Uh -huh. It's again, it's these, these really, really simple indicators. They're very misleading. They're very misleading. You yeah. know, like you'll hit the top of a Bollinger Band, but it just means the, the trend is strong. You yeah. know, and, and so yeah. the Bollinger Band just keeps on going up. And. You know, your, your technical Quieting, teacher right? doesn't, yeah, the, the technical <laughs> teacher doesn't teach you that. Yeah. But um, Ichimoku Cloud, very complicated, but super reliable in my opinion. And Exponential Moving Average Ribbon, EMAR. I've got tutorials on both of them on YouTube. And oh. th those are the only two indicators I use. VPVR number three, which I also have a video on, but this is less important. I only use these two indicators and they are only used to confirm what I call my core analysis, the chart patterns, the support resistance, horizontal levels. You know, I don't like diagonal lines because they're quite subjective. You can redraw them as much as you like, but yeah. you can never, yeah, you can never redraw a horizontal line or box. And that makes it a lot more objective. And like I said, you need to be completely objective until the point that you commit to a trade. And now you're, you're 100% biased. And that allows me to, to have that objective first approach. That's super cool. The Ichimoku cloud, by the way, looks really cool on a chart. Um, yes, yes. Do you use it to, to confirm support and resistance, mainly? Yeah. And, and to predict where support resistance will be. But you'll find that as you go along with technical analysis, you can predict where the Ichimoku cloud will be because yeah. it's quite predictable. You know, like we, we found support over here, so support will be drawn at the same level 30 days later. You know, like you, you can kind of predict this as time goes on. But uh, I find that to be very useful. And uh, one of the reasons is it tells you a lot of things. Number one, it tells you where you might find support, but number two, it, might, it tells you how strong that support might be because um, the wider, the, the fatter the cloud, the bigger that support might be. And I think that's very useful. But with a lot of these indicators, including the RSI, it's about knowing when to use them. When to use them, so, yeah. So yeah, exactly. the, the exponential moving average ribbon, for example, is absolutely amazing. In fact, I calculated it um, on the recent trend up from 20K to 40K, something like that or 12K to 20K, it had a success rate of 16 successes out of 17 attempts, and then it failed. And if you knew how to use the indicator properly, you wouldn't have been open to much of the risk. You only use it when there's a spread, when you can individually see each line. And if you knew about this before, it would have been very reliable to trade, which is what enabled me to take my long position and, and ride a very nice game. That's super cool. The exponential moving average, that is, yeah. Yes, yes. Which um, which time frames do you use, like for and and which uh, specific? Yeah. Four hour, in my opinion, Four is hours. the best. Uh, I I like that time frame a lot. I also use the one hour and one day, and that's pretty much it. I might occasionally zoom in onto the five minute or fifteen minute time frames. The problem here is now there's a lot of new data coming in all the time, and new traders. They make this big mistake of thinking that the more I trade or analyze, the more money I'll make. Mm. And I can't think of any worse approach than yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So 
it's very like I, I deliberately when I started out I had to make a strong point out of not analyzing anything less than one hour because you, you get a new piece of data every five minutes on the five minute time frame that's going to make a gambler gamble yeah, yeah. and so um, I only look at it to um, to confirm what the larger time frames tell me yeah absolutely it's just like validation right, for the exactly decision. just a small just a small bit of extra confirmation, extra confirmation. and like confidence yeah. yeah yeah that's super cool I, I have to you get along really well with Anthony Leswami who just came on the show recently and and he's been in trading investing and finance for you know uh, 15 years now I, I want to get your take on this he told me and he loves data he told me one of the most intriguing data sets that he's ever seen across traders in his previous company, where they took a sample of 900 traders over the course of seven to eight years, I believe. So lots of data on their behavior. Um, and he said the biggest issue for people who lose money on a trade is the fact that we as human beings, where we enter this cycle, this routine where we get paid monthly salaries in 30 days, we get annual salaries, we get, we have daily goals, weekly goals, you know, and he said by setting these specific goals or time frames, that rushes people sometimes to think I need to make X amount in trading this month. And that f takes them out of long-term sustainable habits because they feel the pressure to have a specific target. This, this sounds, may, may sound a little bit crazy, but he just feels like, like society put, puts us in a position where because everything is, you know, for a specific time frame and we have specific targets, it could flaw a trader's decisions. Uh, how do you feel about that? Is it a bit too far-fetched, too crazy, or what's your uh, response? No, it's a very common first approach that people take. And uh, I, actually, I spoke about this yesterday on a live stream where um, a lot of people, they do come into it aiming for a dollar goal or a percentage gain goal. And that's okay it's, it's good to have one generally because then you have an exit plan as long as you use the exit plan that's very important the focus that i think is much more important than that is developing and refining a good system and when that becomes your focus and, and a good system would mean you know you use x indicators look for x confirmations whatever you make your own system this much money in each trade that kind of thing when you make that your focus uh you get taken away from, I need to make this amount by the end of the month, otherwise yeah. my friends will think I'm a bad trader or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. You may, you move away from that and you move, your focus becomes more so, okay, how do I actually trade better? Yeah. It's not about the reward. It's yeah. about how do I push this cart towards the reward? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's almost like, you know, one person is looking at the trophy and the other person is walking towards the trophy. The trophy. And walking towards the trophy is, is the guy who develops and refines a good system. That system will always need refining, never stops. So it's more of a journey than a destination, right? Yeah, and, and, and by taking that approach, you will get to the destination. That's yeah, the exactly. And you'll yeah. get to multiple destinations, right? Because right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not forcing it, right? You're, you cannot force a market to do what you, you said. No, no. And it's, I think it's, it's a lot more grounded and a lot more realistic when you focus, you know, when, when you tell yourself, right, my focus is on the system, you limit the desire to then take a 100x trade on Doge. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just... Now you want to do things that are a little bit more sensible because you're focusing on a system, not on $5,000, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. All right, Sammy, so this is the last segment of this documentary and this, this video with you, which has been an amazing experience so far. And uh, obviously, since we're heading somewhere, I would love to connect that to the markets and, and figure out just your, your idea of where we're heading with the current bull market. How long will it last? What are you seeing happening this year? And anything that can uh, help us see your vision would be amazing. Yeah, so for this bull market, obviously, one of the big questions people ask is how long will it last now? And one of the key metrics that I would use to answer that question is, so in short, my answer is I don't know, but one of the key metrics I'd use to answer that question is, how long has it been since we exceeded the prior all-time high? And in our case, the prior all-time high was $20,000. We exceeded it in December 2020. And so it's been about two months since we exceeded the previous all-time high. And to me, uh, that, that means there's a lot of potential for this to continue for a long time. When we exceeded the all-time high in the previous bull market, 2016, 
we still were bullish for another year and a few months, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that there's a lot more juice left in this market going off of that. And the fact that now we're seeing real adoption and, uh, and, and there's, you know, there's a lot of fundamental reasons to be very excited, as there always is. The, uh, the note I'll make on this, though, is that even when we go bearish, because eventually we most likely will, I still think that there's a lot of potential for the market to still be tradable because the market stays volatile even after a bull market, it's just going down. And if you know how to trade it on leverage, for example, that's not a problem. That shouldn't be scary. So that makes a lot of sense. And you just mentioned that this time there's actual adoption. So does it mean that this bull market or the next bear market will be slightly different from 2016 to 2018? Or, or do you still think that just markets tend to have similar behavior in, in different years? Good question. So usually markets should be maturing and trading in less crazy ways as they get older and yeah. mature and, and more money comes in. But Bitcoin isn't doing that. Bitcoin yeah. is staying crazy. And uh, I'm sure there's examples where this has happened in the past, but I can't think of them. So I don't know what conclusion to draw over here. Um, one of the big things which we talked about in an earlier part was as governments keep on being absolutely terrible, the, the use case for Bitcoin and crypto keeps going up. And I think the pandemic has shown us that governments are completely terrible and it just keeps getting worse and worse every every month depending on where in the world you live right so if that's the case then um i might have to spin the question back onto you and ask you how much worse do you think governments and, and the financial industries will get and according to that i think bitcoin will get even stronger that's super cool and i think uh, among all the people who predict the price of bitcoin you're actually a bit more on the conservative side relative to people you know saying it's going to hit, you know, seven digits, you know, one million, five million, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're very honest about it. Like, uh, because the governments are so terrible, as you mentioned, they they literally suck. The UK is an absolute disaster, by the way, for those who live in the UK, I feel very sorry for you. I live Same. there as well. It's, it's a real disaster. Um, but what is a, a likely prediction? Do you still see like 100K this year? How are you seeing the price of Bitcoin? You know, I, I don't like talking about hard price numbers. See, this is a conversation that's much more about fundamentals. Yeah. And there are people who are much smarter than me uh, who would discuss those things publicly. And, you know, like I'm, I'm very good at technicals, not so much at, at these kind of more political conversations, right? I leave that thinking to the smart guys and I listen to them. They all think it'll hit 100K. So I'm on board with that idea. Uh, we're not far away from it and we're very very early on after breaking 20k so you know it's not like bull markets like this get weaker as time goes on you know they they typically get stronger i don't know how that's possible but that's part of the you know that that's part of the nature of a bull market like this you know you wouldn't really believe how this can happen and it happens anyway they're extremely irrational markets uh so yeah 100 percent. i think 100k is super achievable in this market and do you think like, you know, news such as Elon Musk, you know, having 1.5 billion, et cetera, et cetera, today a MasterCard, as you mentioned, who accept crypto, PayPal. Um, do these specific news tend to extend the bull market a bit or is it just like a peak in the chart? Um, I don't think they necessarily extend the bull market. I do think that they bolster the fundamentals and they make the overall picture for crypto much stronger. And if that's the case, then uh, I wouldn't say it necessarily extends the bull market, but I would say that it makes things more stable and healthy. Uh, it makes it less likely that we suffer extreme crashes. It makes it more likely that we recover from the next crash, stuff like that. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind is, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit of a conspiracy nut, but to me, like all these headlines hitting at the same time, Elon Musk buys, now MasterCard wants to accept crypto, and now Apple's considering Ethereum and all this other stuff. Come on, you know, like this news didn't coincidentally happen at the same time. Yeah, I don't believe that. So, um, ah, so people pumping other people's bags, maybe. Well, you know, I mean, do, do you think Elon Musk bought Bitcoin before? Uh, well, quite likely, you know, like I love the guy, but it's pretty obvious that, you know, he's had his holdings in there and he's just pulling a John McAfee version 2.0 trying to pump other coins. <laughs> Those of you who know that, you're OGs. So, there were some rumors saying that, you know, he actually said that the Tesla stock was overvalued to, to buy back, actually. And there was a dip in the market after he said that. Yeah, I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't know about that. Obviously, it, it could be possible. But again, I, um, 
it's not, you know, we all know it's not a good idea to believe everything we see the first time. Yeah, that's that's a really good lesson. That's a really good lesson. And you, you provided so many cool lessons throughout this interview. And uh, I really hope people focus on these long term, you know, habits. And like you said, keeping a journal, reflecting, understanding yourself and being OK not to trade when, you know, emotionally you're not there and stuff like that. And it's just it's just it's basically um, human psych. It's just life in general now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it applies to everything. And that's why I said, you know, one of the big things for me is I don't think I could have developed into the person I am now had I not traded. I might have found another way, sure, but this was a pretty good way to accelerate a lot of things in my life. Of course, money is a big one, but, you know, I, I think it, it really plays into a lot of different things. And are you one day going to send a letter to your most hated teacher who didn't believe in you and, and failed you in the classes to tell her, look, this is where I am now? You know, I, I got lucky. I didn't, you know, when I was dropping out of high school, um, none of my teachers supported the idea, but none of them were rude about it because uh, that's I, cool. yeah, because I didn't seriously entertain the idea of dropping out of school until uh, until I had, you know, like a few hundred K or whatever, you know, so and that's pretty good, you know, to live off. Land. And the idea was if I screw up, I don't have to be homeless for at least two or three years. And I can find the job at Tesco, well, whatever, Carrefour, Walmart, wherever, you know, and um, and that was the idea. So teachers already kind of knew where my head was at. Um, and the only thing I've done since then is actually I've reached back out to them. Some of them watch my YouTube videos. Some of them are, are enrolled into my courses and stuff. Um, they're very supportive and I think they're great people. I got lucky, you know, other, other teachers, they might have said, yeah, you're going to be a failure. Fortunately, not for me. That's super cool. And so what is the, the destiny for Sammy? Like, you know, now you've reached a certain point in your life, like, where do you want to go next? And so there's two big goals. Number one, trading education is, uh, is pretty good around the space now, but I do it the best and it's the only thing I'm cocky about ever and no one has ever called me out on it. So uh, my goal is to keep uh, re-establishing that crown on my head that I crowned myself with and um, I just keep doing better and better and better, expand that basically to be the, the go-to place for learning how to trade safely, realistically and all those great things. Number two, everything that I'm talking about is largely a stepping stone to accumulate enough wealth to get into the space exploration game. That's what really interests me. It's completely unrelated. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the only thing that I think of a goal and I get scared. I think, wait, is that realistic? Can I actually do this? Uh, the idea is, yeah, to, to push that industry forward. Elon Musk, for example, he has this big vision of plants against the backdrop of Mars. And the idea there is it's gonna inspire so many people to study science and it just kind of pushes the industry forward. And I think that science done properly is one of the main things that's important in, in, in our lives. In, in this kind of time, uh, aside you know, aside from religion and whatever, uh, and that I would like to get into and build my own spaceships and mine asteroids and space tourism, and then eventually find aliens. I don't know. It sounds completely crazy. That's I don't like cool, talking man. about it, but no, it's. I'm glad you did. The crazier, the better, man. The crazier, yeah, the better, right? Yeah, I was. You know what? We're so lucky being online to have so many crazy achievers that tell you things like, yeah. you know, if you're not scared of your dreams, they're not big enough. And I just started believing it, you know, I, I don't know, I was deluded, whatever, but I started believing it and that's what led me to where I am now. So I just keep on going down that same path and it's working out so far. Absolutely, shoot for the moon and reach the stars. And, and I go. think, you know, we even mentioned that in the beginning of, of the interview, so it's good. We did a full circle where, where you talked about, you know, like setting your goals and visualizing your goals and law of attraction, all those cool things, thinking grow rich. So great full circle. Yes, Thank absolutely. you so much, Sammy, for coming on the show and for having me in this cool ride. By the way, guys, it's sunsetting right now and it's absolutely beautiful. Dubai has an amazing sunset. It feels like the sand particles almost are floating in the air. Everything becomes orange and pink, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. So uh, if you guys like this interview, hopefully you did. There's a lot of quality content. If you feel like you need to rewatch it again, please feel free to do so. Don't forget to follow Sammy Four Flies if you haven't seen his content yet. He does have very high quality content like subscribe blast that bell notification and join us every wednesday premiere at a pc near you eight o'clock gmt see you next week guys Peace.